the simple version of the Gaussian elimination algorithm that we've seen last time around needs a little bit of refinement. There are some corner cases that we have to take care of. To review what we had done so far is we approached solving the system of the form AX equals B by changing it to an equivalent row echelon form system which then is simple. It just unravels from the bottom up if we use the back substitution algorithm on that system. But what we've done is we've assumed that we always have a pivot at the location where we were looking. And that is just not true in general. So we have to look at missing pivots. As my first example, suppose I have this matrix here as the matrix I'm trying to reduce. And as you see, I have a pivot in the first column over here. Everything underneath is zero. And so the next step is to come to the second column. And our algorithm so far expected there to be a value that's not zero in this position. Well, what if there isn't? The problem then is I can't declare that to be a pivot. I can't use it to get rid of other variables. But when I transcribe to equation form, I see the problem. Yes, x1 only is in the first equation, and that equation is dedicated to so far x1. But then when I switch to x2 to the smaller system, I too have a leading variable x2 down below. It's just not in the position where I want it. So the easy solution is to just interchange the equation. In this case, interchange r2 and r4. That way, there will be a pivot in my new r2 equation. So I just need to interchange rows two and four. The way that looks in matrix form, well, I've got my matrix here. I went to position two, two, and did not see a pivot in position two, two. It turned out to be a zero value. So I look underneath, and I see that there's a non-zero value underneath. There is indeed an x2 equation in position r4. So what I'll do is I'll interchange this row with the row that I'm currently in, the row where I want a pivot. The row exchange matrix, the matrix that carries out that row exchange, says replace the current row with row number four. So zero times the first row, zero times the second row, zero times the third row, one times the fourth row says copy the fourth row in here. So we get the pivot in here. And then the last row that's the one we are interchanging with the second row. So zero times the first row, one times the second row, plus zero plus zero, copy in the second row. So we interchanged the pivot position and we can continue. In this case, there's already zeros down below, so I don't need to zero those out. I'd simply go on to my next equation, my next column here, and find the pivot two and continue as before. There's another case, however. Look at this particular system. Again, I'm in column two. I'm looking for a variable x2. There's no pivot in the position where I expect it, but when I look down below, there's no pivot down below either. Again, it's actually quite simple. If you transcribe the system, you see, yes, you have a dedicated equation for x1, but then the remaining system doesn't have an x2 in it anymore. x2 is a free variable. And so, the solution is just ignore it. There's a free variable. Okay, let's go to the system that remains and try and dedicate an equation for x3 and zero underneath. So at this point, I do not need to do anything. My variable is free. All I have to do is go to the next variable, therefore to the next column, and look for a pivot and uh, proceed with my algorithm as before. So the solution when there's a free variable, just move to the next column. The point that I'd like to make here is that interchanging rows when there is a missing pivot, if there happen to be a row of zeros, that row of zeros will move to the bottom as a special case. And it will turn out that yes, every so often we can get rows of zeros. And yes, we'll see cases where there are rows of zeros in my matrix, but the solution is we can just ignore that, except there is one little wrinkle here. Let's look at the special case of the zero row. 
if I look at this particular example here and transcribe it, I see that I have this row of zeros here. And when I transcribe it, that second equation reads 0x1 plus 0x2 plus plus plus, plus 0 equals 0. Just the equation 0 equals 0. In other words, there's absolutely no information in that equation. Uh, the remaining system is as before. So a row of zeros, all zeros, isn't really a problem. The equation reads 0 equals 0, and we'll ignore it. Row exchanges will move it to the bottom eventually, and we proceed as before. This, however, another case. I somehow or other ended up with an equation that has a non-zero right-hand side. So this one reads 0x1 plus 0x2 plus 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 equal to 2. It reads 0 equals 2 when I transcribe it. That's a contradiction. This system doesn't have a solution. So the moment I have a row of zeros with a non-zero right-hand side, that is a problem. It simply means the system has no solution. Our equations contain a contradiction. So if I were to continue with the system as before, we are looking at the part of the matrix under A to try and figure out where the pivots are. So right now I have a pivot in one, everything underneath is zero. I move to the second equation. I'm at this position, everything underneath is zero. So I ignore it. I've moved to this equation over here. I see pivots underneath and so I need to change rows to shuffle a pivot up into the position I want. And as a consequence, that row of zeros goes further down. And this will happen over and over and over again until at the very end, I'll have that row of zeros with a non-zero right-hand side. I'll see a pivot in the B column if I simply continue. As a human, of course, I'd stop at this point and say, hey, system has no solution. Now that we've seen these special cases, let's do a couple of example computations. First of all, how does the Gaussian elimination algorithm actually work now? I wrote down some pseudocode for you in case you want to program it up. And if you work in linear algebra a lot, eventually you will code that algorithm for some special pattern of entries in your matrix. But let's look at what it actually does. Here's my matrix. I'm looking for a pivot in position 2, 2. I don't see it, but I see a pivot underneath. And so I'm going to shuffle that pivot up, uh, zero out the enters underneath. So I have a pivot here. So this equation is dedicated. I'm finished with it. I now go to the next equation and the next variable. So I'll go over by one, down by one, to this entry two here. If I don't have a pivot at all, so I'm sitting here, I'm looking for a pivot. I don't see a pivot underneath. I haven't dedicated this equation yet. Where I'm going to go next is sideways. I'll go to this position here. I'm staying in the same row and go to the next column, one column over, and then I proceed. So there's a big difference here. If I have a pivot in the current column, I'm going to treat that pivot, and then I'm going to go to the next row and next column. If I don't have a pivot, I stay in the same row. I just go to the next column. So, the remarks, therefore, there are two cases here after we treat a given column. If there is a pivot in the current column, we move to the next column and next row. If there is no pivot in the current column, we move to the next column, but we stay in the current row. When we find a pivot, we have to zero out every entry below the pivot before moving on to find another pivot uh, in our algorithm. Otherwise, we would reintroduce values where we had put zeros at the previous step. So whenever you use a pivot to zero something out, zero every entry in the current column before you move to the next column. My next example will produce a row of zeros. It has redundant equations. So look at the following. I've got my matrix over here, and I'm going to run the algorithm. So here's my first pivot. I'm going to use it to zero out underneath. So my pivot is in the first row. I go to the first column, and let's see. To get rid of the minus 1, it's plus 1 divided by 1. So we put in an entry of 1. 
next entry is minus one, the next entry is minus one. We carry out the steps implicit here. So for example, if this says first row plus second row, so simply add the first row to the second row to get my new second row and thereby introducing the zeros we want. And so we get to the next step. We pick this one in position two, two for our pivot. Now the pivot is in the second row, therefore entries in the second column. We figure out the matrix that will put zeros in and carry out the computation. And look what just happened. That third equation turns out to be all zeros. Okay, so what it was, if you look back here in the previous step, if you look at the second row and the third row, those rows are the same. They're actually the same equation. I wrote the same equation twice. And therefore, trying to put a zero here is simply going to wipe out that equation. It was redundant. I didn't really need it. Actually, if I try and go a step above it, I don't quite see it that way. That third equation, one, two, zero, three, doesn't appear to be independent. But if you look at it, if I take two times the first row and add the second row to it, I get that third row. Two times the first equation added to the second equation gives me that third equation. And therefore, that third equation had no information. My algorithm will say zero equals zero as a consequence. So I'm here at that row of zeros. I move one over, one down. I'm trying the zero here as the pivot. Well, it's zero underneath, so there's no pivot to be had. We move over, we try this zero as a pivot, and this time there is a pivot underneath, so we are going to interchange rows three and row four. Here we are interchanging rows three and row four. And once we do that, uh, we see that uh, we are in row echelon form. There's no more pivot underneath here. And when I move to the next equation, I get zero equals zero, just like I want. So at this point, all that's left is we decorate our matrix to make sure we've got row echelon form and we fix the three variables and basic variables, and then we transcribe. So let's see. Over here, I've recopied the matrix. I'd normally do it in the layout. But I've put in my row echelon pattern. I drew that staircase just to convince myself that, yes, the matrix is in row echelon form and to see where the pivots are. Right? They are in the corners of those steps. So my basic variables, the ones that uh, have pivots, are the first variable, the second variable, the fourth variable. The remaining variables, the third variable and the fifth variable, don't have pivots, so we assign arbitrary parameters to them. And then we unravel from the bottom up. So I already have my parametric representation for the three variables. I add the next non-zero equation to it. So that's x4 is equal to 2 plus x5, and reduce, that gives me x4. Then I go to the next equation up. That one tells me that x2 is 1 plus x3 minus x4 plus 0 here. And plugging everything together, I get my x2 value. And finally, from the first equation, I get my x1 value. And to finish it all off, I transcribe it into standard form. And just to check the first part, that constant vector here should solve the system. So if I plug it in, I should indeed get the right-hand side. So let's see, what did I have? x1 is 1, x2 is minus 1, so 1 minus 1, and then 2 times x4. So 1 minus 1 is 0, plus 2 times 2 is 4, adds up to 4. And when I do this multiplication, so just transcribe that vector, put it up here, and do the multiplication, we indeed get the right-hand side. For the remaining two vectors, when I substitute, I should get 0, 0, 0, 0 for the right-hand side. So that's the way to test it. For my next example, let's see a case where we generate a contradiction. So here, I've got my system. And if you look, if you compare it to the previous system, it's just a slight change, right? I have a 5 in this position. Now I've made it an 8. So my third equation, 
is no longer consistent with the first two as a consequence. Let's see what the algorithm does. So we write down our system, we fix our first pivot, we zero out the entries below, we move to the next row and next column, and here's my pivot now in position 2, 2. We figure out how to zero out the entries below. Here's the matrix that does it. So that gives me the next row. And then, hey, wait a second. The next row reads 0 equals 3. So I know I have an inconsistent system. Me as the human, I'll stop right here and say this system has no solution. A computer program in general is not programmed to look for such special cases. It will assume that in general everything will work, and when it doesn't, it will see it at the very end. So let's see what the computer program does. It comes here and says, well, I need a pivot here. I have zero. I look underneath, zero. There's no pivot, so we move sideways. I have no pivot here. I look underneath, I see a pivot. Okay, so I interchange rows 2 and 3. Here's the matrix that interchanges rows 2 and 3. I carry that out. So now I've got my pivot here. I look next. In this uh, column, I have no pivot. So I move to the right, and I'm in the B column. And in the B column, I have a pivot now. I have a contradiction. So from the computer program's point of view, if at the very end, after finishing Gaussian elimination, we have a pivot in the B column, in the right-hand side, there is no solution. Let's talk next about the number of equations, the unknowns, and the solution. Let's have a definition to make the language a little bit easier. We'll say that the system AX equals B is consistent if and only if it has solutions. Otherwise, we'll say it's inconsistent. So with that, we've seen that a system is consistent if and only if road reduction does not lead to a contradiction. That is, if the system does not have a pivot underneath B on the right-hand side. As an example for such systems, well, look at the first example over here. I have three equations with a single variable. x equals 3, 2x equals 6. Well, that's consistent. It's just two times the previous equation. But the third equation reads x equals minus 3. So if both x equals 3, x equals minus 3, we'll end up with a contradiction if we run our algorithm on this. The second example over here, x plus y equals 3, 2x plus 2y equals 6, we have two equations in two unknowns. But if you look, that second equation is just two times the first equation. In actuality, I only have a single equation here. My system is consistent. It will have solutions. But my equations are redundant. I'm going to have three variables over. In this example, I have two variables, x and y, and three equations. And if you add the first to the second equation here, you'll see that you get the third equation. So this third equation here is redundant. I really have a system of two equations and two unknowns. And as you start to see, the more equations and unknowns that I have, the harder it would be to actually pick out the fact that I have a redundant system or that I have a contradiction. I will have to run the algorithm to end up seeing it. So here is where this gets us. If I have a system AX equals B and I have N unknowns, then I'll have a unique solution provided that the system is consistent. Well, that simply says there's no contradiction when I run Gaussian elimination but I'm asking for the solution to be unique, so I can't have any free variables either. And no free variables means I will have to have a pivot in every column of the row echelon form, of a row echelon form that I get to. So I need the system to be consistent and not to have any free variables. If I do have zero rows in the row echelon form and my system is consistent, then I can't have a non-zero entry on the right-hand side. So I'll have rows of zeros, both underneath the A matrix and underneath the right-hand side for a consistency. If I don't have any zero rows, right, then the system can't be inconsistent. So no zero rows means that the system must be consistent. We always will have solutions in such a case. It will mean that there is a pivot in every row. There's no row without a pivot. There's no zero rows. 
a row echelon form that has zero rows, well, it will have zero rows if one or more of the equations in AX equals B are linear combinations of other equations in the system. And one other remark to make is we've all learned way back when that we have a unique solution for a system provided we have n equations in n unknowns. Well, we now see that that's almost true. We have a unique solution uh, provided we have n equations in n unknowns in a row echelon form system, not in the original. On the right, I wrote down the decision tree here. We look at the row echelon form system. First question we'll ask is, are there any zero rows? Well, if yes, then I have to check whether or not there's a contradiction. If there's a contradiction, I have no solution. If I don't have a contradiction, I have one or more solutions. Well, I'll, I'll be over here. The other way to get over here is to say, well, I've got my system in row echelon form, and I don't have any row of zeros. I will have solutions, therefore, but the question now is, do I have free variables, yes or no? If I don't have any free variables, the solution is unique, whereas if I have free variables, I have an infinite number of solutions. I'd like to invite you to do something at this point. Take each one of the paths through this decision tree and to show the pattern of the pivots in the matrices that this assumes. It will be well worth your time. So let's capture some of this in a theorem. Suppose I have a system of equations ax equals b and corresponding row echelon form rx equals, well, the b will have changed to some new vector b tilde as we carry out our algorithm. And now what we have is that the system has no solution if and only if that b tilde has a pivot. So if it has a pivot, no solutions. If it doesn't have a pivot, if all the zero rows have zero right-hand sides, then the system is consistent. We will have solutions in that. If the system is consistent, then the solution is unique if and only if it has a pivot in every column. If R has a pivot in every row, then it doesn't have zero rows, right? So it's always consistent in such a case, and it's consistent for all right-hand side vectors B, no matter what. The other case, however, is if there are zero rows, then I can always run my algorithm backwards. I can choose a B tilde vector that has a non-zero entry. Let's make it zero everywhere else, but that's non has a non-zero entry in a zero row. And then we go backwards to our original system, and we can always do that. We wrote equivalences between our systems, and we'll end up with a right-hand side vector that leads to this inconsistent system. So the moment I have a system with a zero row or more zero rows, I know that there are right-hand side vectors for which I will not have solutions. Now, my next observation is that there's a pattern in the Gaussian elimination solutions that you have. I'll again look at the system we had in 2.2, and here it is. The vector had a constant vector, plus alpha times a vector, plus beta times a vector. And alpha and beta were our free variables, x3 equal to alpha, x5 equals to beta. And of course, I have a solution, no matter what alpha I plug in here, no matter what beta I plug in. A little bit of terminology, just so it's easier to talk about this. The solution is the following form. It has a constant vector, which we'll call a particular solution for the system. It does solve AX equals B. And then it has these remaining terms, alpha times a vector plus beta times a vector plus gamma times a vector. We'll call those homogeneous solutions. Okay, the, actually, it's all possible homogeneous solution. I plug in all possible alphas and betas. But what the homogeneous system solves is the problem AX equals zero. So. The first term, the particular solution, the remaining terms, the homogeneous solution. I'm going to show the free variables here, and I'm going to show them in red. So x3 was 3. x3 turned out to be 0 plus alpha plus 0 beta. x3 equals alpha. And x5 is 0 
plus zero alpha plus one beta. X5 is beta. Now look at the pattern that I get. My free variables in the particular solution here, my free variables are equal to zero. In my homogeneous solution, the alpha vector, that's the one that corresponds to x3 is equal to one times alpha plus zero beta. So in my alpha part of the homogeneous solution, I have alpha equals one, beta equals zero. So I have the pattern one, zero. Similarly, in the second solution, the beta solution, x5 equals beta, that means that I have x5 equals zero alpha plus one beta. So the beta vector will have x3 equals zero, x5 equals one. So look at my pattern. Particular solution, zero, zero. The alpha solution, one, zero. The beta solution, zero, one. For the free variables. In fact, this generalizes. I'll have 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, etc. The red enters here. The first one will be all zeros. The second one will be a first column of i. The next one will be a second column of i, and so forth. This observation will prove useful later. We'll see it again. So setting alpha equals beta equals zero, that's how we got constant solution. And then the three variables we got from choices alpha equals one, beta equals zero, and alpha equals zero, beta equals one. With k free variables, we just get more and more columns of i. At this point, we have a working Gaussian elimination algorithm. It turns out there's some variations on that algorithm that prove useful. So here is an example matrix. I have this matrix A, my first pivot was at position 1, 1. I've zeroed everything out. And now I'm here at position 2, 2, and I see a possible pivot equal to 2. So normally, the way my Gaussian algorithm works, I'll choose that entry for my pivot. But for numerical reason, that's not the optimum choice. It turns out the better choice would be to use the maximum absolute value of the entries I could choose for a pivot. So instead of the two, I'm going to scan down the column and say I could use two, I could use absolute value of three is three, I could use this as the pivot, three. Here I could use that as a pivot, minus 10, absolute value is plus 10. 10 is the largest entry in absolute value here. I use that as my pivot value. This choice of using the maximum absolute value pivot in a given column is called partial pivoting. I can do a little bit better. Rather than choosing just another equation than the current equation to use for my pivot, I could also say I could reorder the variables, the remaining variables. So an even better choice would be to reorder the remaining variables as well. And what that means in my pivot over here is I have all of the sub-entries here that I can choose from. I can choose an equation, so I can choose any number in the second row, third row, fourth row, fifth row, and I can choose which of the remaining variables I want to do. The ones that are still available are x2, x3, x4, x5, and x6. And when I look for the maximum absolute value in this case here, I see this value of 100. And so this is the value that I would choose. I would reorder my columns. I would reorder the variables so that I can choose that 100 as my pivot. If I look in all of the remaining rows and columns, that is called full pivot. So I can also apply full pivoting to my system, which works better numerically. There's yet another variation that we want to look at, and it's called Gauss-Jordan elimination. The easiest way to treat it is to simply look at an example. Let's say I have the following system of equations. I've already gotten it in row echelon form. The first equation dedicated for x, next for y, z, and w in terms. But if I look, for example, if I look at that third equation, that leading variable z, if I were to use that leading variable z to eliminate the z above it, I wouldn't change the x and y's anymore. They're zeros that don't enter. 
I can choose to eliminate the z variable. Of course, that will change the w and that will change the right hand side, but that doesn't change the form of the system over here. It's still going to be a row echelon system. So I can use that z to get rid of the z above it as well. So here's how that goes. If I look at the machinery, it's exactly the same as before. What's the multiplier? I want to get rid of the two. So minus two divided by the pivot, that's minus one. I'll take the first row and replace it with the first row minus the pivot row, this row over here. Similarly, for the second row, I want to get rid of the four. So minus four divided by two, that's minus two, and so I'll replace my second row by minus two times the third row. So second row minus two times the third row. And I've gotten rid of the Z's in the remaining system. I can do the same thing with the W's. I can do the same thing with the Y's. So I have a choice. When I do Gaussian elimination, I could eliminate not only below, but also above a pivot. That method is called Gauss-Jordan elimination. So rather than immediately going to back substitution, if I ran the algorithm uh, Gaussian elimination to this point, I could take all my pivots and eliminate above as well. I actually have some freedom as to the order in which I want to do the computation. I'll explain it in a second. But look how this works. I am in row echelon form, and I'm going to work backwards because over here I'd be computing zeros that I know will be zeros. I don't need to do those zero computations. So here, I see a pivot here. I want to eliminate the entries above that pivot. The pivot is in the last row, therefore the last column over. To get rid of the one, it's minus one divided by the pivot, we enter a minus one. To get rid of this one, it's minus one divided by the pivot. Here's that minus one. To get rid of the 2, it's minus 2 divided by the pivot, so we enter it here. Now we carry out the instruction set. First row minus the last row. 1 minus 0 is 1, 6 minus 0 is 0, 2 minus 0 is 2, 1 minus 1 the 0 that we wanted, and then 8 minus 4 is 4. Similarly for the others, it works exactly as before. So at this point, I have zeros above my last pivot. Let's move to the previous pivot now. This pivot here, I can use to zero out the entries above it. The pivot is in the third row, therefore the third column will have numbers in it. Everything else is the identity matrix as before, so it's just these two values you have to figure out. To get rid of 2, it's minus 2 divided by 2, minus 1. To get rid of the 4, it's minus 4 divided by 2, minus 2. We have figured out our operations, let's carry them out. The, each instruction set in turn, so first row minus third row, second row minus two times the third row, copy in the third row, copy in the fourth row. It puts the zeros above our third pivot. Now we go to the next pivot here, to, to the second pivot, and we do the same thing. We'll get rid of the six. It's minus six divided by three is minus two. And multiplying this out, we now have a system in row echelon form. And above and below every pivot, there are zeros. So we now have an incentive to actually scale these pivots to 1. Uh, the first equation I don't have to touch. The pivot's already equal to 1. The second equation, I'm going to scale by 1 divided by 3. I'm going to multiply 1 over 3 times the second equation. And now that pivot is equal to 1. The third equation, 0, 0, 2x3 is equal to minus 2, will scale by 2. So the third equation, I'll multiply by 1 half, and I get this equation here. And finally, I have this equation. And I'll look at my system again. I now have i for my rho echelon form equation. And if I try and solve that by back substitution, it's absolutely trivial. This reads x4 is equal to 4, x3 equals minus 1, x2 is equal to 2, x1 equals minus 6. So I immediately get my result. Of course, I was a little bit lucky I had no free variables. If I do have free variables, I might get a system that looks like this. I have three pivots in this system. I've zeroed out below and above the pivots, and I have scaled the pivots to 1.
So I have a rho echelon system over here that has this special form that the pivots are equal to one and above the pivots are zeros as well. When I try and do back substitution to this system here, it again is quite simple. When I do Gauss-Jordan elimination, what happens to my pivot columns is they are successive columns of I, of an identity. I don't necessarily have all of them, but each one in turn, and then the next three variable to the right, to the right, to the right, is the next column of I. In the previous example here, I had all of I. In this example here, I have got the first three columns of an I of size four by four, and I have some extra free variables, so I have some extra columns uh, mixed into my system. So we want to give a name to this special form matrix. We call a matrix like this a reduced row echelon form matrix. Before I write down the formal definition, I usually like to ask my students which method they like better, Gaussian elimination or Gauss-Jordan elimination. Typically, a large part of the class says, well, it looks like Gauss-Jordan elimination is a lot simpler. I'll run the same algorithm, and then back substitution is trivial. Well, it turns out that back substitution, yes, is extremely simple. We did all the work by zeroing out above the pivots. But the bad news is that it requires twice as much work as Gaussian elimination. But we don't just zero out entries below the pivots, we also zero out entries above, and that's twice as many entries. And when I compare that to the computation that I have to do for back substitution, that's negligible. So in terms of the amount of work I do, unless it's very small systems, it's actually much better to use Gaussian elimination rather than Gauss-Jordan elimination. Just to capture what we've said so far, a matrix is in the reduced row echelon form, if and only if, well, first of all, it has to be a row echelon form matrix to begin with. And what we'll have done to it is we'll have scaled all the pivots to one, and we'll have made sure that all of the entries above the pivots have been eliminated. So the entries above the pivots are zero. The way the matrix looks is successive columns of I in a reduced row echelon form. Now, if you look at the matrices in my stack over here, you'll see that A has many different row echelon forms. I kept changing the row echelon form here by simply getting rid of some values above it. And so the row echelon form is not unique. However, if I go all the way to reduced row echelon form, either this matrix for this system or a matrix like that in general, that matrix is unique. So we have a theorem. The reduced row echelon form of a matrix is a unique matrix. So today's takeaway, therefore, is we've done Gaussian elimination for real, and we looked at some variants. In particular, we've looked at the Gauss-Jordan algorithm as a second method. And basically, what we found is that missing pivots simply result in free variables. So we just move to the next variable in our matrix. If we have redundant equations, we'll get rows of zeros. We don't really need to do anything special. The algorithm will shuffle that row of zeros down below. But if we have a row of zeros, we might want to look at the right-hand side. Because the moment we have a non-zero right-hand side, we know that the system has no solution and we can stop the algorithm right there and answer the question, what are the solutions for AX equals B with there is no solution. So what we see is that these algorithms show us that there are only three outcomes. If the system is not consistent, if I end up with a row of zeros and a non-zero right-hand side, then I have no solution. If the system is consistent, if I don't have such a case, then it only depends on the free variables. If I have no free variables in a consistent system, I have a unique solution. If I do have free variables, well, I can assign an infinite number of values to those free variables, so I'll have an infinite number of solutions.